what we're going to do is we're actually going to move on. And we're going to move on to now taking that single stage equilibria system to a multi-stage equilibrium system. Okay, and we're going to be doing that with something called the Hunter-Nash method, which is akin to the mccabe teal or the Ponchon-Savre method for distillation. Okay, so it's a liquid-liquid extraction equivalent of those methods. And then we're going to think about liquid-liquid extraction general design. Okay, so what we need to think about when we design these columns and also moving on to slightly more complicated versions of the columns over these simple multi-equilibrium stage systems. So very similar to we did last week for the single stage extraction system, we actually thought about our whole process and we could look at a mass balance around essentially one separation. But now we've got a multiple, multiple equilibrium system. What we actually have is essentially N of these systems. So we now have you know, N multi-stage equilibriums in our system. So what we can start with is we can again think about a total overall mass balance. So that's just the mass balance essentially of what goes in to our system totally, so either end, which is the feed and our solvent, and then what comes out of our overall system. So that's E1, which we've called, which is our final extract product, the product we want, and Rn, which is our final raffinate product. Okay? And again, like the single stage system, these sum to give our total material in the system, M. And again, we can also think about a particular component, so our component I, and we can look at that particular component in the feed, the solvent, the final extract, and the final raffinate. Okay? Now, the difference is now, as well as having this total mass balance over the system, we also need to think about a mass balance at each of the particular stages within our system. Okay? So, if we take our little end stage as our general stage to actually take a single stage mass balance over, we can basically see that we have Rn minus 1 and En plus 1 is what enters that stage N. And our Rn and our En are the two products which leave that stage. Okay? So we've got the raffinate from the stage below, the extract from the stage above going in, and then the extract and the raffinate, which is the equilibrium produced at that stage, coming out. Now, what we can typically do with liquid-liquid extraction systems is we actually think about what's called the difference in flows. So, the difference in flows is essentially defined as the difference between the raffinate and the extract on one side compared to the other side. And if we actually rearrange our total mass balance for that stage, we can get this. And what we find is that the difference in flows at either side of the stage is equal to this value delta. Okay? And that value, that difference in flow value delta, never changes between the stages. Okay? Because if you think about it, if that pair difference is equal to this pair difference, then this pair is the same as this pair, which must mean that the next pair along is also the same difference, so every flow pair is the same. Okay? 
So this gives us a very important value of delta. So that's the pairs on either side giving us delta. We can also do exactly the same for a particular stage, but for a particular component. So in this case, we can do exactly the same with our component i. So again, we can just think about the component i on either side of our system going in. So in this case, on this side of our stage n, and on this side of our stage n, again, essentially giving us this delta x delta, which again is the same for every stage. Okay. So using knowledge of this component balance and this total balance, okay, what we're actually generating now is we can start to rearrange that equation and we can essentially get this form of equation here. Okay? So from the last lecture, we also saw a similar form of this equation which was when we were looking at deriving the lever arm rule. Okay? And that showed us that it meant that the R n minus 1, E n, and this value here were essentially all on the same straight line. Okay? So what we're doing here, it means that for each of our stages, there's a straight line that goes for our component flow rates and they all, every single stage, that line also passes through the same point, which we can define as an operating point. Okay? So if we think back to distillation last year, what you created was you created an operating line, yeah, and you move between the equilibrium line and the operating line. Okay? But with distillation, there's a similar technique to that, which is the penchant savaret method, where you have an operating point, and essentially you take your equilibrium and move between the equilibrium from the operating point. This is the same as that method, where we're linking the, di the difference in these flows here with an operating point. Okay? So what that means is we can actually link each end of our stage with an operating point and we can also link across each stage with that equilibrium which we get from our tie lines. So we should know the feed that goes into our system okay? and it's also very likely that we have defined what our extract should be. So we therefore know our feed and our extract. So using the difference of these flows, we can calculate our operating point. Okay. We can then look at the equilibrium for our system, which allows us to look at the equilibrium of the extract and the raffinate for that particular stage. Okay, and then repeating the process, we can then say, well, we now know our raffinate coming out, but with knowledge of our operating point, we can then calculate our extract for the second stage, which we can then link across with the equilibrium for the second stage. And what we can do is work our way along our system using this process. Okay? So I'll go back again to say like distillation last year when you had your equilibrium line and an operating line and what you did was you stepped between the operating line to the equilibrium to the operating line to the equilibrium. Okay? So we're doing exactly the same style here with our liquid-liquid extraction system. Okay? So this should become a little bit clearer if we actually think about an example, okay? <clears throat>
So let's take the same system that we looked at last week. Okay, so 400 feed, 100 solvent. So exactly the same system. Okay, last week we just looked at a single stage. So the equilibrium of this system was defined by the tie lines directly. Okay, if you remember, we, we had to find our mixed point and then we could then use the tie line that that mixture point went through to find our two products. In this case, because we're doing a multi-stage system, what that allows us to do is actually define the extract that we want. Okay? So now, instead of just taking that single stage equilibrium, which is we mix it together and we get out what comes out, we can now define our product. Okay? So this is our mixed point from last time, and as I said, it was defined by this tie line. But now, let's say that we want 2.5% of our solute in our raffinate product. Okay? So what we can actually do now is take that as a defined system and use our multi-stage system to actually calculate that for us, okay? Okay, so... So, as we looked at last week, We'd already calculated our mixed point, so I won't recalculate that because it's the same process as last week. But now what we can say is that we know our raffinate product wants to be 2.5% of our solute A. Okay? We also know that as it's a raffinate product, it must come out in equilibrium. Okay? So that means that it must be on our equilibrium curve. Okay? So what that does is it allows us to find a point on our equilibrium curve that's got 2.5% of our solute and is on our raffinate side. Okay? So we know that our raffinate is on our feed side. So if we look for approximately 2.5% A, so this is our C corner, our S corner, and our A corner. So about 2.5% A would be along here. And it wants to be on our curve on our raffinate side. So we can essentially define this as our product. Okay? So from the mass balance, we now have a mass balance for our total global system, okay? So what we said is obviously the feed and the solvent going in has to be M, but also our overall raffinate plus our overall extract coming out also has to sum to M, okay? But we know that because it is a mass balance, we know that the R, the E, and the M all must lie on a straight line together, okay? So if we've defined our R, then what we can simply do to find our extract composition and extract point is we can essentially draw a straight line from R that passes through M until it hits our equilibrium curve on the other side, and we can define that to be our extract. Okay? So does that make sense? Yep. So we're just using... Yep. 
Yeah, so, so to calculate where M is, we do exactly the same as we did last week, which is we calculate, we plot our point F, we plot our point S, and then we can either do a mass balance on our components to find what composition M is to plot that, or because we know that M must be on that FS line, we could use the lever arm rule to actually find, so to find the ratio of the line lengths between FM and MS uh, to actually find what distance that M is on the line. Okay? So, what I'll do now actually is I'll do the lever arm rule but in reverse so that we can see how to calculate the, the, the actual flow rates for E and R. Okay? So, first of all, we can actually just take off, if we need them, we can take off the compositions of E and R by actually reading them off the graph. So, obviously, we've got 25% of, of our solute A, but we can also, for completeness, read off the composition of the carrier C, which is just, uh, which is just less than 93%, okay, and we can do the same with our solvent, which is just under 5%, okay, so we can just read them from this point here, and we can also do the same with our extract product, so just over 45% for A, about 12.5% for the carrier and just less than 42% for our solvent. Okay? And what we can see is because we've now got this multi-stage system, we actually have a much better separation than we did when we just used the one-stage system. Because because instead of having our product defined by this tie line here, we've now essentially increased the amount of A in our extract and reduced the amount of R in our raffinate product. So we've made our separation better by going from that single stage to the multi-stage. Okay? So now we've got our E and R points. What we can do is use the lever arm rule. So what we can do is actually measure the distance between E and R. Okay? So we can say the distance between E and R is 8.3 centimeters. We can also measure the distance between E and M. Okay? So E to M is 4.9 centimetres, which of course allows us to immediately know that the distance between M and R is 3.4 centimetres. Yep, so does that make sense? All I've done is just measure the distance between our three points that we've drawn. Yep. So we know from the lever arm rule for our extract and raffinate products that we can say the extract to the raffinate is equal to the length of line MR to the length of line EM. So we know from our measurements that that's 3.4 to 4.9, which gives us approximately... 0.694, okay? So we therefore know that our flow rate of E is, no, is 0 0.694 of that of our flow rate R, okay? We also need to know the total flow rate of the two products, which we know. So the original question started with 
a feed being added to a solvent, okay? And that gave us a total of 500 kilograms. So if 500 goes in, 500 must come out. So we also know that E plus R equals 500 kilograms, okay? So that allows us to combine these together and just say that 0.694R plus R equals 500. So our R, so our final raffinate must be 295.5 kilograms, which leaves our extract to be the difference, which is 204.5 kilograms. Okay, so we can simply just calculate that from those measurements. Okay. That's a very poorly written C. Okay. okay, so does that make that make sense for everyone? Yep. Cool. So just to make things a little bit more readable, I've just taken the lines away, but I've left the extract point, the raffinate point, the feed point, and the solvent point on our diagram, okay? Which are our key points that we need. So when we looked, so when we looked at the mass balance for our overall system, and we looked at the, and we spoke, and I spoke about the flow pairs, the difference in flow pairs, what I basically said was that the difference on either side of our system has to be the same and the same and it always is delta okay and what that means is if this is our if this is our overall multi-stage extraction system that we have our feed coming in and our solvent coming in and we have our raffinate coming out and our extract coming out, okay, that our overall flow pairs are these two flows here, so the R and the S and the F and the E, okay. So what that means is we know that E, F, and delta must lie on a straight line and S, R and delta must lie on a straight line, okay? So if we want to find our operating point, we can actually use that to our advantage because we know where S and R are and we know where E and F are because we've already defined them. So what we can do is draw a straight line between S and R, and we can also draw a straight line between E and F. Okay? And if we do that, we find that the lines cross, and where the lines cross, we define as our operating point, okay? So that's given us an operating point for our system. So now we have that operating point, we can follow that process that I said, where we do 
operating point to define the flow pairs, equilibrium to define across the stage, operating point to define the next set of flow pairs, equilibrium across the stage. Okay? So, if we draw that on our system, so we know that the extract coming out of our first stage must be in equilibrium with the raffinate coming out of that first stage, okay? So then that is defined, that equilibrium is defined by our tie lines. So you can see our extract point here. So we can approximate its position to the tie lines we have. So it's approximately three quarters of the way to the upper tie, to the upper tie line. So we can approximately say it should be about three quarters of the way to the upper tie line on the other side. So therefore, we can draw and say that if this is our extract coming out, this must be the raffinate that is in equilibrium with it. Okay? So does that make sense? We've just used the equilibrium across the system. Yep. So then, as I said, the next process is now we've got that raffinate. We now want the flow pair for that because the flow pair for that is the extract from the next stage. And we know because it's a flow pair, it must also have a straight line that passes through delta. So we can use that to our advantage and say if we draw a straight line from delta through R, across to the other side of our equilibrium, Between E1 and R1, yeah, so the, the, blue, the blue tie line there is, what I've said is that E1 is not quite on a tie line itself, but because there's technically an infinite number of tie lines, we can approximate a tie line from the existing ones there. So as a good guess for an approximation, we can see that E1 is probably about three quarters of the way to the top tie line, to the tie line above it, compared to the one below it. So, we, yeah, so we approximate that it's also going to be that same proportion on our other side, yeah. Okay? So that allows us to find R1, and then from R1, we then use our operating point to go allow us to go back across and find our extract for our second, yep, and then we continue that process, so we can then look at our extract two, and look at the tie lines, and then calculate where we think our second stage raffinate product comes from, okay, and then just like you did when you were looking at distillation, so just like you did with the McCabe Teal method, you essentially continue this process until you get below the specification that you want. Okay? So, as I say, you continue this process. So, we did our E1 to our R1, back across to E2, and then down to R2. And we continue this stepping process, operating line, equilibrium line, operating line, equilibrium line. And we continue this until we get to a value which is below the R that we specified, okay? So we either meet or beat the specification that we wanted, exactly as you did 
with like the McCabe Till method. Yep. And then if we want to know how many stages we have, what we do is we count the number of equilibrium lines that we actually have. So in this case, we would count the number of red lines. So in, to make our specification here, we actually need one, two, three, four stages in our liquid-liquid extraction system. Okay? To move on so we could actually think about general issues that we actually want to think about when we're designing liquid-liquid extraction systems. Okay? So what we've, what we've been looking at in terms of the, uh, the Hunter-Nash method that we've been using is we've been looking at what's called a single section cascade system. So essentially this one here. So we have a feed being added at the top and a solvent being added at the bottom and we have an extract coming out by the feed and a raffinate coming out by the solvent. Okay? So this is essentially the simplest version of liquid-liquid extraction that we can have. So we can actually start to think of more complicated systems for the for liquid liquid extraction design that gives us more flexibility. So as I said, when we moved from a single equilibrium stage to this single section, which has multiple equilibrium stages, what that allowed us to do was that allowed us to move from having an, from having a, an extract or a raffinate composition determined by just the equilibrium to have us to be able to specify one of those, okay? So in, in the example you've been looking at, the first one, you can specify how much solute is remaining in your raffinate, okay? But the extract is still then defined by the mass balance in the system, so essentially how much solvent you add to the system, okay? If we need to be able to specify an extract and also specify a raffinate that essentially are not linked like this, we need to bring another degree of freedom into our system. And essentially what we can do by that is we can start to bring in these systems here that look more like a distillation column. So instead of having the feed at the top, we can have the feed in the center and essentially we get some separation down here to our raffinate, but then we have another section above where we can actually go to our extract and then we can recycle some of our solvent and extract back into our system. Okay? And we can make this more complicated still by actually looking at a dual solvent system. So potentially the separation we don't get, the, the separation that we get is not good enough for us. So we can enhance that separation by actually selecting one solvent that actually wants to dissolve one of the components in our feed and a second solvent that will actually be miscible with the other component in our feed. So we actually can use a dual solvent system to start to produce a more pure product of our two components in our A and our B. Okay? But what we have to do when we have a situation like this is we have these solvent recovery steps here. Okay? And those solvent recovery steps are where we're essentially removing our solute from our solvent. Okay? So that's actually another separation. So that 
separation may actually be an entire distillation column. Okay? So although we're getting more flexibility in our liquid-liquid separation, it's meaning that we're getting more and more coupled separations in our system. Okay? So when we think about designing these systems, we essentially need to look at our design considerations. So, you know, as mentioned right at the start in the first lecture, we've got things like the feed flow rate, the composition, the temperature, and the pressure that we have to actually think of when we're designing the systems. Obviously, one of the most important things with liquid-liquid extraction is that your feed is a liquid, okay? So it needs to be the condition where these are a liquid. You've got the temperature and the pressure, so the temperature and the pressure affect our equilibrium, our, sol our sol solvent equilibrium, so that actually affects the size of our liquid-liquid two-phase region, if you remember from last week. And it also affects the tie lines within that region. So we can make some adjustments to essentially the, uh, the mutual solubility by changing the temperature and pressure. But as mentioned in the first lecture, that if we do that, that's often quite expensive. So heating and cooling is quite expensive if we can just run this at the conditions we've already got. So we need to think of our stage configuration. So it's normally unlikely that one stage is good enough. So we at least need to think about a multi-stage, so single section system. But we may also want to think about a two section system, either with one or two solvents if we're doing this in the real world. We then need to think of our recovery. Okay, so if we've got our recovery, are we actually making it pure enough? Are we actually producing enough from our system? And that would help us determine whether we want this single or double cascade system. We also want to think of the, the feed separation. So if we're actually looking at a two-section cascade, okay, we need to think again about the separation that we're actually having because we've now got the two solvents potentially in our system. So the choice of solvent is incredibly important with liquid-liquid extraction. Okay, so we need to pick a solvent that can actually dissolve our solute but also we want a solvent that is immiscible or as immiscible as possible with our carrier. Okay? On top of that, we need to think about how we're actually going to separate our solvent from our solute after our liquid-liquid extraction stage. Okay? So what separation are we actually going to use to separate those two? So we need to make sure that although we've picked a solvent that will dissolve our solute, there must be another property difference within them so we can actually separate those two components. Okay? We also have a separation, uh, we also have to separate them into two liquids, right, within our system. So we picked a solvent, or hopefully picked a solvent that is immiscible with the carrier, but because we need them to form two phases, we also need to think about the density difference between those two liquids. Because yep. if they don't mix, but they've got a very, very similar density, it will take a very long time for them to actually settle into two layers so we can take that separation. Okay. Again, the operating temperature and pressure of the system, so we can change the equilibrium very slightly by changing the temperature and pressure. But it's expensive, 
So just like with the feed, we want to stay near where we are. The solvent flow rate. So for our one section cascades, we can change the solvent flow rate. Using more solvent will generally get us a better separation. But using more solvent is more expensive because we're using more material. Okay? And just like with distillation, if we're using a two section cascade, we've got the reflux rate that we need to think about. And these two values here are actually coupled in with our number of equilibrium stages. Okay? So that's our major things to think about in terms of picking the properties. And I know I've gone through this fairly quickly, but I just wanted to, to make you, to get you to sort of think about these things. There's more information in the handbook, which is why I'm not going through this in great detail. Okay? So I'd encourage you to look at that information to give you more information on these. There's also we need to think with, so we could have potential issues. So if we pick the wrong, we pick the wrong uh, solvent, we can actually start to form emulsions. Okay? And if we start to form an emulsion, that's potentially stable. And that means we're not actually able to actually separate these two into two liquid phases. Okay, and that causes us a big problem, because then we can't separate our two liquids. Again, this is the same problem. I say with interfacial tension and phase density difference, we need to be able to do that separation. Okay? If we've got very low interfacial tensions or surface tensions, then that means that it's very easy to start to form an emulsion within our system, and then it can start to become stable. One of the other things we need to think of is now we move into these multi-stage systems or multi-section systems, we're starting to increase the amount of time we're actually in the extractor for. So just like with distillation, we need to think how long are we actually in our system for? So do we have a chance that our, one of our products actually might start to degrade in our system? Okay? So say like in the first week, one of the examples was penicillin, and we determined we might use liquid-liquid extraction to separate penicillin from water. And penicillin starts to degrade at about 50 degrees. However, at cooler temperatures, it still starts to degrade, it's just much slower. So if you're having to do the liquid-liquid extraction process at 40 degrees to allow to get the extraction, you only have a certain amount of time before it starts to degrade, okay? Because you have to keep it chilled to keep it in good quality. And then as I've been mentioning, we need to think about essentially cost and power requirements and also the type of liquid-liquid extractor that we want to use. There are multiple different types of extraction systems. So all the equip equipment that we can use for extractions are very similar to the types we can use for absorption, stripping, and distillation. Okay, so these are sort of packed columns, things like this. They're often very inefficient unless we're dealing with low liquid viscosities and high differences in the density between our solvent and our carrier. But what we can do is if we start to have some of these problems, so higher viscosities, less density difference, we can actually start to bring in things like centrifugal force to help us with the separation or mechanical agitation to help us with mixing the phases together. Okay? But the key thing is, is regardless of the type of equipment that we actually use, 
we need to calculate the number of equilibrium stages first. So we need to use our Hunter-Nash method first. Okay? Then when we've got that number of stages, we can then look essentially at a height of theoretical plate or a height of theoretical unit. So, like last year when you were looking at distillation, but distillation sort of impact columns, you essentially had correlations to calculate your height uh, per theoretical plate. So you take the number of equilibrium stages times by that gives you the height of your packed column for distillation and absorption. We can do exactly the same with liquid-liquid extraction. So a height to a theoretical plate or sometimes the height equivalent to a theoretical stage. And we can tie them together to get the height of our column. When people are discussing liquid-liquid extraction system, just two the, the main convention that people use is that the dispersed phase is the one that forms the droplets and, and all the discontinuous phase they use, whereas the phase that doesn't form the droplets is referred to as the continuous phase. Okay, so when you're re if you're reading more information about this, they may, people may refer to it as the dispersed phase or the discontinuous phase or droplets and the continuous phase. Okay? So what we've done today is we've actually looked at uh, some general design for liquid-liquid extraction systems. And then we've looked at the Hunter-Nash method and how we can actually use the, uh, the ternary diagrams we've got to calculate the number of equilibrium stages. And that's for a single section system. Okay? And then we've just had a... We've just had a really quick sort of mention of some of the things we need to think about when we're actually looking at designing liquid-liquid extraction systems. Okay, and then there's more information of that in the handbook for you to have a look at and think about what we might need to do when we're designing these systems in real life. Okay? Okay, everyone, so um, what I said I wanted to move on to was, was looking at, essentially, if we're thinking about a two-section system. So, if we're thinking about a two-section system, what we need to do is actually start to develop how we draw our operating points for the two sections. So... If you, again, think back to distillation, in distillation you've got one section above the feed and one section below the feed, yep? And what you end up with is two operating lines, an operating line for the stripping section and an operating line for the rectifying section. So in this case, with our two-section liquid-liquid extraction, what we're going to do is end up with two operating points. One for the section above the feed and one for the section below the feed. Okay? So what we need to do is look at the mass balances on different parts of the systems to find out how we can plot those operating lines on our system. Okay? So what we can do first is essentially think about a mass balance that's actually around the bottom of our extraction system. Okay? So in this case, we can look at what comes out and we can say EN and the RK plus 1 come out of our system. And what goes in is our EK 
plus our Rn plus 1. Or we can alternatively name that to be our feed 1, because that's one of our feeds into our liquid-liquid system. So just like we did when we looked at the one-section system, we can look at the flow pairs. So we can take an EN minus the F1 and say that must be equal to EK minus our RK plus 1 and define that to be an operating point. Okay? So that helps us to start off with, but we also need some more information to start to think about these points. So the next step we can do is actually look at a mass balance around our solvent recovery. Okay? So if we look at a mass balance around the solvent recovery and reflux section, then again we can do exactly the same, look at the materials that go out, and in this case, we have F1 that leaves, a D that leaves, and our recovered solvent that leaves. Okay? And the only thing that enters is our EN, so our final extract. Yeah? So we can rearrange this. Because if we actually take F1 from, our, from both sides, we're actually left with D plus SD equals out our EN minus F1. But from the equation above, we already know what that is, and that equals our delta 1. Okay? So we've now got two different sets of lines that line up with our delta 1. Also usefully for our solvent recovery area, we can also rearrange this to essentially say that our final solvent out is equal to our EN minus our F1 plus D. Okay, so we've just defined what the recovered solvent is by itself. Okay, so so far we've just developed three useful mass balances for our system. Yep. So the next thing that we can look at for our system is we can also think about a total for the entire system. Okay? And again, repeating exactly the same process, we know what comes out. It's our D, our recovered solvent, our final raffinate product, and what goes in globally is our solvent and also our overall feed, F2. Okay? And we know from before that our solvent plus our overall feed also equals M. Our, our total amount in the system, right? So that's the same as if it's a single, a single section system. Yep. So we can rearrange part of this equation. So if we take the M and we take the D, S, D, and R bit, we can say that M minus R1 equals D 
plus SD. Okay? But we've already seen from number two that D plus SD equals delta one. So we can define a delta, another delta one. So now if we quickly just recap what we have. So before with our single section system, we were able to use the feed and the extract as a pair and the solvent and the raffinate as a pair to find the position of delta one. In this case, we were able to use the feed and the extract to find delta one and also our total mix point and our raffinate to find delta one. Okay? So that gives us a set for our delta one, but also I said, so because it's a two section system, we're now gonna need two operating points. So we also need to think about a second operating point, okay? So, we, so now we, look, so we looked at the bottom part of our column to think about our delta one. So now we can also look at the top, top part of our column which should allow us to think about a delta two for the system. So again, we can define what comes out, R1 and EJ must be equal to what goes in, R J plus one and our solvent S. So like we did for the bottom, we can define the difference in the flow pairs and say R1 minus S and Rj plus one minus Ej is equal this time to delta two, okay? So because we need two, two expressions to draw our two straight lines for the delta, we can again now look at the mass balance around the column. And repeat exactly the same again. So we know it's R1 and EN that goes in and it's, sorry, that comes out and it's S, F2, and F1 that go into our system, okay? We can rearrange this to say that it's a, a flow difference in flow pairs again, and say that it's F2 and a EN minus F1 equals our R1 minus S. So we've already seen that R1 minus S is delta two. F2 is something that we know. And our EN minus F1 from here, we already saw EN minus F1 is equal to delta one. So we can define our final mass balance expression as F and delta one will allow us to give us delta two, okay?
So if we take this example system here, so in this case, we've got a solvent and a feed, and we've been able to calculate our total flow rate because we've been told the solvent and the feed ratios. We've been given a specification for R1, okay? But because we're now using this two-section system, we have the advantage that we can also freely specify our final extract product, okay? So they're now no longer joined by having to have a mass balance straight through the M, like this, we can now specify our extract product to be what we want, okay? So we can now take a look at our mass balances that we did, and we can start to pick out our... Oops. Sorry? We can, now start, we can now pick out the lines about the key bits of information that we know. So one of the things that we know is that M, R1, and Delta1 okay, are all, all lie on a straight line. So we've got R1, M, and Delta1 are all on a straight line. We've got, we know that SD, EN, and F1 so SD, EN, and F1 lie on a straight line. And what we've done here is if we look at this system with our solvent recovery, what we've assumed is that our solvent recovery step is very, very, very good so that the SD is basically equal to just having our solvent. Okay. And the final one we can get is we know that EN, F1, and Delta1 also lie on a straight line. EN. Okay, so the first thing we can do is we know. R1 and M. So R1 and M. And we can draw a straight line between them. So we know that delta 1 lies somewhere on that line. And from this one here, we know that EN and F1. So EN. Oops, sorry. sorry, we know SD. And EN goes to F1. So SD, we have said, is the same as our S. We've got EN. And because we've decided that our recovery is very good and we've got no solvent, we've got no uh, other components in our recovered solvent, it also means we've got no solvent in our other recovered components. So that means that if we draw a line from S through E, that we can specify our F1 to be on this axis with no solvent because we've done a very good recovery of the solvent. Okay? Then we can go to our third one and go EN and F1. So EN and F1 is back down the same line, and they meet at delta 1. So where they cross, our line that we drew with R1 and M, which is here, we can define 
our delta 1. Okay? So from the second bit of the mass balance for the top of the column, we, again, we define 2 for the delta 2. So we had R1 and S gives us delta 2. So that's R1 and S to delta 2. And that's our F2, our delta 1, and our delta 2 were also on a straight line. So that's F2, delta 1, and delta 2 are also on a straight line. Okay? So then we can look at our system and go R1, which we know, and S. So we can draw a straight line from R1 through S. We also know F2, which is here, and delta 1. So we can draw a straight line between F2 and delta 1. And where they meet, we can define our delta 2. Okay? So what we do is now we're finding our stages. We can start from the top, or we can start from EN, and we work down using, our, using the tie lines for the equilibrium part and delta 1 for our operating point for that part of the column. And then when we pass our F2, delta 1, delta 2 line, so when we get below this on our diagram, we then continue to use the equilibrium lines, but we then switch to using delta 2 as our operating point. Yep. So exactly like when doing distillation with the McCabe till, when you're in the top half of the column, you use the operating line for the top half of the column. When, you're comp when you move below the feed, you then switch to using the operating line for the bottom half of the column. So exactly the same process here. Okay? So what we've done is just moved from looking at uh, a one-section system to bringing in a two-section system where you've got that extra degree of freedom. So the two-section system is quite a lot more complicated than the one-section system. There's a lot more lines and op uh, to think about, okay? But this system is a lot more like the real systems that you will be thinking about during things like design project or when you're actually trying to design liquid-liquid extraction columns, 